accepting that there are differences between people. And while these differences exist, and you have to acknowledge them, at the same time, you can live together, aid one another, but that it can best be done when you act as good neighbors always do. Last week, in part one, on the legacy of the apartheid mastermind Hendrik Verwoerd, we highlighted racial identity and racial tension still dominating the South African discourse half a century after Verwoerd's assassination. In part two of this week's episode, we turn the spotlight onto the education system. Verwoerd had one priority and that was to disenfranchise the majority by messing up with the education system. That was his priority. White children were brainwashed to tell them that, look, you are not equal to black children. So in a way, education was used as a tool to ensure that South Africa is divided into more. Half a century after Hendrik Verwoerd's death, a new social movement for free quality education is driven by mainly black students across the country. On matters shown that your call for is to fall, or your call that is was fall, is a legitimate one. The AC struggle to take over South Africa taught pupils it is virtuous to burn down your schools. If you don't like what you see around you, just boycott the schools. Just make it impossible to offer you any education. We can, we can sit down, we can privilege, it's fine. We'll work with everyone else who has absolutely nothing to lose. Because the privileged have everything to lose. They have their privilege, their status, their class, their material possessions. As ordinary blacks, we have nothing to lose because we have nothing but the land that we walk on, which also does not belong to us because it was taken. In tonight's second part on Hendrik Verwoerd's legacy, we ask, is the youth at the forefront of a new social movement to dismantle apartheid's legacy? Hendrik F. Verwoerd was appointed Minister of Native Affairs in 1950. It was in this ministerial capacity that he started planning his Grand Apartheid Scheme. One of the main laws enacted at this time was the so-called Bantu Education Law. This would ensure the segregated schooling of children from different race groups. At the 1950s, when the Bantu Education Act was introduced, um, the government made sure that um, Black people, black children, were only going to do certain subjects that were not done probably in white schools. For instance, there was, there was an emphasis on subjects like woodwork, um, domestic uh, science for, 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 for girls. Hence, there was an uproar. You know, many people said, no, this is not the right kind of education. Verwoerd's grandson, Weinand Boshoff, says it's a myth that Verwoerd destroyed an already existing education system that catered for black children. When Bantu education was instated in 1956, uh, it didn't replace a flourishing, uh, functioning, widely based black education system. It actually followed nearly nothing. There was a really small schooling system, uh, mainly driven by the, uh, by the churches, funded by the government, and the, the rationale of that education was to create a small elite which will easily uh, work with in, a, in an English colonial system. The, the mission school education, the, the British were intent on dividing the black communities. You know, immediately when you succeed, you become part of the elite. You know, all of a sudden, you are better than the community you, from which you are coming from. And moreover, education was more to Christianize, you know, the people rather than gathering knowledge and so on and so on. So uh, Verwoerd thought of an alternative to that and he brought in a widely based uh, education system which expanded um, basic education even to the uh, level of grade 12 within a very short time. 
Similar to mission schools, religion would still take center stage in the new education system under Verwoerd. If you look at, at down the line, 1967 for example, when the National Education Plan was, 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 was introduced, you'll find that there were felt schools, what was called the felt schools, and youth preparedness programs where white children were, were, were brainwashed to, to, to tell them that, look, you, you are not equal to black children. So in a way, education was used as a tool to ensure that South Africa is divided into more. And what was surprising to this was based on Christian principles, Calvinist principles that God did not want you to be equal. The root had one priority, and that was to disenfranchise the majority by messing up with the education system. That was his priority. Tsepo Motsepe from the NGO Equal Education says Verwoerd era policies around Bantu education was geared towards creating a black working class. Menial workers uh, saw them as, as, as slaves, saw them as dependent on, 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 the, on the state for, for jobs that will see the, 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 the minority, which is mainly white people, being uplifted by the large majority of black people. But moreover, that what he saw them as, saw them as excess labor that can be thrown out whenever they felt like it, you know, their, their power, um, physical strength had been overused. And that denied majority of them the right to choose what type of individuals, what type of jobs they wanted to do, what type of institutions they wanted to, to study in, what type of an economy they wanted to uh, create. When black people were involved, they, they, there was more emphasis on, on, on labor, making sure that there will be labor, there will be skills that are there, you know, rather than on knowledge. All of them made sure that girls would be good domestics. They could cook, they could do needlework, and those were emphasized. So irrespective of they can be, 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 be good and adept in, in arithmetic and, and, and English and Latin and so on, but the most emphasis was on skill. This was what was very important for their future, according to the, to the teachers, to the school establishments and so on. In his biography on Verwoerd, author Henry Kenny sets out Verwoerd's goal with apartheid. Did Verwoerd and his National Party government achieve this? The fact that South Africa is uh, still running very well with some exceptions, 25 years after, um, let's say, full democracy uh, dawned upon South Africa, is exactly because a widely based black education system was enacted. Had we proceeded with the policies of the United Party, which was in, in, in power before 1948, their policy was to educate a very small elite of black people to do the so-called indirect rule. Black Englishmen who would govern all the colonies, including South Africa, as British colonies. So I would say, uh, contrary to basically uh, everyone's belief due to the current narrative in South Africa. An important part of the Woods legacy is the fact that we have a large and knowledgeable African intellectual class to govern this country. May his soul never find peace because the reality is that we're dealing with what he made a reality today. The poverty that you're seeing, the school dysfunctional schools, the majority of our learners who continue to be recipients of an inadequate system. Uh, within the basic education system. It's as a result of what they had built and they've successfully implemented it. Generations of young black people continue to suffer, uh, uh, you know, an indignity when it comes to the education system that has condemned them to deep-rooted poverty, uh, infrastructure that is crumbling, an education system that continues to, to condemn them to, 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 to poverty. Around 1978, if you look at the provision of money, Money was given to a white, a white child was about 711, whilst the African, the black Africans, it was 59 rands. So that shows you that Bantu education was really intent on ensuring that black children, white children, they never get to the same level and they understand that, you know, they are not supposed to be equal. That was, that was the tragedy of apartheid education.
It doesn't always make sense. It's easy to ignore. It's always asking questions. What if cars could drive themselves? What if we could drive on the moon? What if headlights were lasers? What if cars could run on water or even air? It's called your imagination. And if you listen to it, great things will happen. It's what we do at Audi. It's what we call Vorsprung. Since the late 1950s, resistance against apartheid mounted. Anger also grew against a deeply unequal education system. The resistance against Bantu education uh, really got on the way in 1976, uh, 20 years after it had started. And Wally was very much aware that it is exactly going to um, generate political awareness amongst black people. It was not something which would have caught him unawares if he had still been living. It was designed that way. The year 1976. The apartheid government implements a policy prescribing Afrikaans and English as the main mediums of instruction at all schools. It ignited the already simmering anger of the black youth. They took to the streets of Soweto in what would go down in their history books as the June 16 uprising. What started as a peaceful protest degenerated into a rampage and later exploded into a bloody conflagration which left hundreds dead and cost the country an estimated 50 million rand. Images such as these would be beamed across the globe from South Africa. The education system was put under the spotlight. And the resistance was a clear signal to the apartheid government that a movement led by the black youth would pose a serious threat to the regime. It was not only schools that formed part of Rivut Bantu education plan, he also designed universities to cater for the different race groups. Look at the universities, for instance, that were built on, 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 on different races, you know, when if you were white, we were expected to go to this university, to a vet university, to a University of Cape Town. If you were black and Kosa, you were expected to go to the University College of Fort Hare. All these were divisions that were based on apartheid. Up to today, you'll find that we have problems because universities built in rural areas still struggle to get funding because of the area where they are. They are often, in a malignant way, being referred to the Bush universities, which were established under Firbut. Interesting that none of those so-called Bush universities um, uh, perished under the actual of of um, Padel Asmo, uh, unlike some of the Afrikaans universities. But the University of Venda is still there, the University of Transkei is still there, the University of the Western Cape is still there. and. Uh, that is the first serious attempt in South African politics, uh, especially from the white side, to say that we need to reach a post-colonial situation with all South Africa's people. A moment of victory for the students, who spent the last month fiercely campaigning for its removal. And for them, Rhodes has finally fallen. 50 years after Verwoerd's death and 22 years into democracy, the first serious attempts to break down colonial symbols start at the University of Cape Town. The so-called Rhodes Must Fall movement is born, and with this, one of South Africa's most prominent social movements is once again led by the youth. Sort of as a rebellion or a revolt against the the, not only the Rhodes statue, but the coloniality of um, Rhodes University, as well as Cape Town, as well as UCT. And that spiraled over into um, free decolonized quality education because of the fact that um, there was a need, not only in, at Cape Town and in Rhodes as well, 
but also from other institutions of higher learning with regards to fee increments and the fact that we don't have free education and even the education that we do have is very colonized. So to a large extent there was uh, some sort of an overnight um, kind of transformation that started with a, f a very small group of people. We cannot be surprised. You know if you look at our society, the South African society, there are just so many things that were, were never addressed. So roads must fall. It started as a concentration on symbols. You know, looking at Wompol in Church Street, looking at the, the statue of Rhodes in, in, in the University of Cape Town, and then spread throughout the country where people were looking at all these symbols to say that we, we don't need these in post apartheid South Africa. And then you spread into, into Fees Must Fall. October 2015. A large group of student protesters gather outside the union buildings. By now the call for free education has been pushed to the forefront of the national agenda. This shows the structural problems that we have in society. That we are still battling with so many, so many problems that we have inherited from apartheid. And the thing is, we, we are looking at these 20 years after, two decades later, is because maybe we didn't look at these very closely at the beginning. That is why now they are haunting us. Everyone, everyone should be able to understand why we would want free quality decolonized education, especially in 2016, especially 22 years into the so-called democracy, um, as we see now that we're living in a post-apartheid apartheid state. So for me, I expected it to be more than just students and um, some members of society that I lobbied. I expected it to be even the old generation, especially that of 76 as well, and those very passionate themselves about education education and how they were going to get taught and in what language. So you, you kind of expect that um, the people that will be there are a larger constituency than the ones that you have. I think the protests are as a result of the striking nature of inequality that is, that is becoming so prevalent in the system. So in an interesting way, the, apart, the, the reality of Bantu education is starting to be realized now when there's a force that is coming directly opposing it, the force of equal opportunity, access, um, transformation, equity within the system. But where you're finding it to becoming much more prevalent is when you look at the youth, young people that have gone through the democratic education system and a democratic government coming out and saying, actually, I've been miseducated. What has been the problem? look at artists, they've got one of the abilities to either form new conversations, they can paint a picture of a country, they can paint a picture of a mindset of a country. The Cape Town-based ballet dancer recently won at the 2016 and 2017 Rolex Mental and Prodigy Arts Initiative. South African hip-hop right now is sitting at a level where it's Ngutu, Yipikai and Rola. When you put them all in one room, you actually have like the ultimate super South African fan. And you're watching trains, do not go anywhere, stay right there. Catch trains for that one hour weekly dose of art and entertainment news every Saturday from 12 to 1. September 2016, the cap on university fee increases last year did not end the student revolt. Ongoing protests at universities across the country continue. By now, many campuses are forced to suspend classes. Some employ private security companies to try and quell the unrest. It is absolutely disgusting. We've had students who've passed away, students who've been shot by rubber bullets. So you get to see the kind of violence that we've experienced. And the police, for me, becomes one of the, 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 the guarding tools. They become one of the forefronts, sort of the faces of kind of violence that we experience um, intellectually, um, philosophically at the institution, but now they make it more physical and visible. 
the situation extremely tense at this morning. Uh, uh, the breaking news at this point as well now. Let's just move towards that direction. This is where uh, one of the students, one of the student leaders uh, has been arrested. Uh, we understand there are two of them that have been taken uh, to the Hillbrow police station at this point. Let's see if we can't speak to them just very briefly uh, right here on air. Busisiwe, uh, if we can just have a word with you at this stage. Busisiwe. Uh, uh, Busi Siwe, uh, wh why are police saying they arrested you? Um, and police arrested me for asking too many questions, um, essentially about another student who was arrested. It's saddening, one for me especially because my mother actually trains police officers, right? So it becomes a bit awkward in the house when I have to go back and I've got rubber bullets on my body and I've got stun grenade wounds and tear gas and it's just like you trained these people to do this to us. I think um, outside of just the police, also private security, the fact that private security are ex-mercenaries is unacceptable. These people do not know how to handle um, peaceful conflict um, situations such as FIS must fall. Problem is that we are still struggling today with is that the ANC in its struggle to take over South Africa taught pupils it is virtuous to burn down your schools. If you don't like what you see around you, just boycott the schools. Just make it impossible to offer you any education. That is a virtuous thing to do. So they did it. Indeed, they got the country. But what inheritance? that they get. They, they have an inheritance of people who don't take responsibility and who are not, who don't accept accountability for their education. They just want it for free. They can, they can sit down with their privilege, it's fine. We'll work with everyone else who has absolutely nothing to lose because the privileged have everything to lose. They have their privilege, their status, their class, they have their cars, their material possessions. As ordinary blacks, we have nothing to lose because we have nothing but the land that we walk on, which also does not belong to us because it was taken. Well, they both need to realize that they have a responsibility to make sure that they confront the inequalities, but moreover that the, the middle class has a far greater responsibility in this country to realize that unlike the poor of the poorest in this country, they need to step up their game. The same with vets and, and, and in UCT students. They need to realize whenever they speak about decolonization, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's a Walter Sisulu University which lives every day a different type of decolonization because it was what Steve Biko called those bush black uh, universities where black people are condemned. Those are the type of you know, contradiction that exists within the system. And those are the things that we need to be quite aware of instead of a, a blanket approach to say everything in South Africa is, is just uh, you know uh, black and white there are gray areas within uh, th those two uh, dynamics higher education and training this year received an additional 9 September 2016 amid mounting pressure from the fees must fall movement higher education minister Bladen Zimande calls a media briefing to announce an 8% cap on nationwide university fee hikes for 2017 Protesting students across the country are angered by this move. Dear comrades, I stand here before you reluctantly. 19 October 2016, amid concerns over the growing university violence, a peace accord meeting is called by prominent cross sectoral leaders. Why must we sit in a meeting with Adam Hadi? You have no show. You have absolutely no shame whatsoever. We will never forgive you. We will never forgive you. You are a cruel. I don't know how you pray and a month. I don't know how you pray. You got police to harass us, to shoot at us. You are very cruel. You are a very, very cruel man. I hate you.
and why the Constitutional Court has said that at the core of that Constitution is building a society that is based on human dignity, social justice, and equality. And thank you for reminding us that while some of us were enjoying life, some of you were left behind. By now, a Ministerial Fees Commission is appointed by President Jacob Zuma. Government is criticized for not addressing the university funding crisis sooner. But Higher Education Minister Blayton Zemande insists that in a country with competing developing needs, there are no finances available for a blanket free education approach. There is nothing, truly speaking, called free education because somebody pays. Okay? In other countries, is the taxpayers who actually pay. In South Africa, it's the taxpayers who give you money up front and then say, when you are working, bring it back in order to assist others. Strictly speaking, somebody is paying. Like this no fee increase is the taxpayers who paid for it this year. And next year, it's going to be the taxpayers who are going to pay for it. So we must understand this slogan's property. The present government, particularly the Department of Education, were to move away from this idea that we've got so many priorities uh, that, you, what, for instance, what Equal Education speaks of, to say fix the infrastructure, and they say we've got so many priorities. If they can move away from we've got so many priorities and we need to go back and start saying what were the intentions of Bantu Education, which were made so clear, and our present government has not been able to say our intention is to get the vast majority of our people out of the gutter education system that they find themselves in. It is a big movement that would have a huge impact on society. It's not the end though. It's not the end. I still believe that there will be many more movements, you know, where people would see this. We, we, we need to take this into our own hands. We need to do something to change society. But yes, the students, because they are future intelligentsia, maybe will tend to think deeply as to what kind of society do these young people want. The spot for border change in society started way before Fees Must Fall came about. Um, it started when the Freedom Charter was drafted, it started when the Constitution was drafted, it started when the ANC refused to give the land back to the people, it started when um, education became commodified. So to a large extent we are just echoing things that have always been there in society. So I think Fees Must Fall is one of its kind that has come out, but there will be other calls um, that will come out as well for land, um, for economic um, access, for redistribution and shares in mines. There's different kinds of struggles that are there for black people, but ours as this youth in 2016, our generational obligation is free decolonized quality education.